Hi everyone, Susan here with the Sacramento History Museum and I am coming to you live from the southernmost street of the Mansion Flats neighborhood. And we're going to do a walk through Mansion Flats neighborhood, but I wanted to start here first. Uh, first, we're going to make sure that everything is working okay, so give us a thumbs up if you can hear us and we'll get started. It's going to be quite a walk today and I will say too that um, it's going to be 90 in Sacramento today, so if it's uh, if you're wondering why we're like wearing big hats and it's kind of warm, that's why. It's uh, uh, and I, I we've got quite the walk. I actually had to map it out to figure out where all we're going because uh, I had a really hard time narrowing it down and and deciding which spots I wanted to show you. And this spot behind me is probably the one that I could have taken out the easiest. It's certainly the furthest from like the sort of area that we're going to be walking into. But um, there's a reason why I kept this one. So as long as we're good, everyone can hear me. We've got thumbs up. Everything good? Okay. So uh, we'll get started then. So um, behind me actually stands the Sheraton Grand. Uh, it used to be uh, the public market. It was built in 1923. And the architect who designed it was none other than Julia Morgan. And that's why we start here, because I'm a very big Julia Morgan fan. So we'll actually walk and talk this way as we're going, because um, I've got a lot of information, but we also have a long way to walk. So we're going to keep going. So that's the Sheridan Grand. Keep that in mind as I tell you a little bit more about this information. Now, Julia uh, Morgan was one of the first female architects in the United States. I mean, she's just this amazing person. She uh, designed the um, Hearst Castle in San Simeon. So that might be where you know her more, but she has a lot of other uh, places. And if you, like me, love Julia Morgan, uh, tune in in like two weeks maybe three weeks we're going to be doing uh, a neighborly walk in Elmhurst and uh, there's a, a Julia Morgan uh, building there too so pretty exciting stuff now the public market uh, has gone through a lot of changes this is kind of why also I wanted to start on this end of mansion flats is because um, this area is very much like, it feels like downtown. It feels like this, the downtown part of Sacramento. And we're going to be walking into the more neighbor part, neighborhood part of downtown. So that building, the public market has gone through so many changes over the almost hundred years since it was first built. Uh, in the 1970s, it was actually converted into state offices. And then in 1999, it became the lobby for the downtown Sheraton Hotel. We're gonna pause here. We got a lot of streets that we're gonna cross today, so this might happen a lot, but that's okay. <laughs> so it wasn't until 1999 that it actually became the, the lobby area, that, at least that building, for the Sheraton Hotel, and that's what it still is today. So pretty cool. But I think um, that building is a really excellent example of like repurposing of older buildings instead of tearing them down and building something new. And we'll see a lot of that, we can keep going, here in Sacramento. Um, we're a big city and we're growing like by hugely, right? We're growing so much and uh, you know, there's need for when there is that kind of exponential growth for bigger buildings, places to live, uh, infrastructure, all that sort of thing. Um, but if we can maybe repurpose these historic buildings and not lose that character for our city, that would be really, that's a really important thing to do. So that is uh, one of the, that uh, type of preservation that is possible when you kind of think about different uh, ways to use these old buildings. Now, in front of us, or almost there, we are going to come up on another building that was built in the 1920s. On a lot of these walks, we focus on, like earlier, or on a lot of these talks really, we focus on a history of Sacramento that's earlier because our museum is located in Old Sacramento, which is one of the oldest parts of town. And uh, so we, we usually are talking about 1800s. But this is special because now we're, we're into the 20th century and we're talking about a totally different range of architectural designs and elements and a history that Sacramento has that we just don't get the chance to talk about enough. So I'm pretty excited for you to like come around this corner and see this next building. Da, 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 da. You can kind of see it from here. 
This is the Sacramento Memorial Auditorium. Now, it was dedicated to those who served our country, hence the memorial in its name. Um, that's why it, it is called that. Um, and it was opened in 1927. Now, let's just wait here for a second so we can safely cross the street. Okay. Like I said, lots of crossing of streets today. I couldn't decide. I couldn't narrow down all the places I wanted to talk about. There's too many cool places. So the Sacramento Memorial Auditorium came about after a vote in 1923 um, that was a, a vote to approve a bond that was passed by Sacramentans in order to fund this, uh, the building of this. And it was created in order to have a place in Sacramento to have conferences, to have concerts, to have um, trade shows, you know, these kind of things that are really important to towns and bring a lot of people to the town. But um, Sacramento didn't have really before then. Ta -da! <laughs> You can see the amazing architecture too. It's very classical in design. But it, um, so Sacramento didn't really have that despite us being the capital of California. And so this was like a big movement of the people. You know, I think we can actually go a little bit closer and cut around this way here. So you can see um, on the, 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 um, building here it says this building is dedicated to those who made the supreme sacrifice in the service of the United States hence the Sacramento Memorial Auditorium now it was designed by architect let me get his name right Arthur Brown Jr. Okay, Arthur Brown Jr. He also, uh, you might know his designs because he also designed the City Hall in San Francisco, which is so beautiful. Just like this is so beautiful. And he designed the City Hall in Pasadena. So he's uh, a pretty well-known architect. So Sacramento really went all out. Do you want to get a shot of just like how beautiful this is? The dark red brick and the size. I think uh, a lot of people don't realize how big this is. Oh, I just think it's gorgeous. So we'll sneak down here and walk along the sidewalk here. Um, it was also, or I guess as an example, I had to write this down because I am not familiar, uh, of Northern Italian architecture that kind of brings together a lot of different kinds. It looks very classical to me out in the front of it with the columns, but you can also see like the tile roofs and uh, you know, different, parts like that. So I think it's a lot of different kinds of uh, designs that was maybe popular at the time, which again was the 1920s, which is just a, an amazing time for architecture, quite frankly. Oh, on that side, you can see the Ladybird um, mural. You can see it maybe a little bit back here on this side. I'll point. Ooh, it's my hand right there. Ta -da. <laughs> That's one of the special things too when we're doing these walks. Um, Sacramento has wide open walls, which is a mural festival every single year. And uh, when you're walking through downtown, you get to just kind of spot these and like the Ladybird mural based off of the um, the movie, of course, Ladybird. Uh, I've seen a few times, but I'm never like 100% sure where it is. And look at that, we just walked by it. How special is that? All right, so here, we'll hurry and cross the street. Oop. So as we're crossing the street, you can definitely tell that this neighborhood has gone through a lot of changes, right? This is not a neighborhood that has stayed a residential thing. It's not just businesses. It's a lot of different things. And we're going to start walking, though, more into the residential part of the neighborhood. It's called Mansion Flats, but it wasn't always called that. It was called Washington for um, quite quite a long time, actually. And um, it was changed actually somewhat recently. But why it got its name, obviously the flats part, it's named after like Alkali Flat. Uh, so now next to it, which Alkali Flat is right next, next door, that neighborhood is right next door to where we are. Um, and so it, it became the flats, right? 
but it's known as Mansion Flats. And gosh, I don't know. I just can't figure out why it got this name. Mansion Flats, how strange. Yeah, just kidding, obviously. <laughs> this is why it got its name right over here is this home right here which is Im imposing and beautiful and huge and it's just amazing i i love it it's like the sacramento white house and i mean that literally it is like the sacramento white house it's, it's um uh let's get around it so you can see the front of it it is for our executive uh people i suppose you might say you got a shot of that. Oh my gosh, it's just so beautiful. So everybody, this of course here is the governor's mansion. And that's of course where we get the name Mansion Flats. It was changed in the 1980s in order, uh, and I think it was just like a, a neighborhood movement to name it after or to include this beautiful home here in front of it. So let's talk for a second about this just incredibly beautiful home. Ugh. I can see like a winding staircase in it from here. If you were here, you could see this too. It's so cool. So this home was originally built in 1877 as a private home for Albert Gallatin, and I assume his family, unless he uh, lived here alone. He was a Sacramento, uh, he was partners with um, the Sacramento hardware store of Huntington and Hopkins. And if you have visited our museum, you know exactly where the Huntington Hopkins hardware store is now. So check it out, right? Now Gallatin hired the architect Nathaniel Goodall and the builder Uriah Reed. And I have a, a picture here of what it looked like um, when it was Albert Gallatin's house. And as you can tell, it hasn't actually changed all that much, right? It is so, uh, it was as beautiful then as it is now. I would say more likely the, the things around it has changed more than this house has actually changed. Now, Nathaniel Goodall, who was the architect, like I said, he was a 49er. He came here for the gold rush. He came via the Panama route. Um, and he also built the Walkhorst uh, jewelry store in Sacramento. He was a pretty well-known architect here in Sacramento. I have a picture of that jewelry store. Again, it's a picture, not a fo photograph but I think you can almost see like the similarities, right? He loves a good mansard roof and, and uh, different kind of architectural things like that. We'll keep kind of walking this way because we just got a lot of ground to cover. But <laughs> um, so Gallatin, Albert Gallatin, he actually sold this house to Joseph Steffens, who was a local businessman. And that was in um, 1887. And eventually Steffens, uh, Joseph Steffens, sold it to the state of California because the state of California was looking for a place to house the governors who Sacramento is the capital. They need a place for the governors who kind of come in and out of Sacramento to call home. Here, do you want to come this way so we can have the house behind us? So they bought the house from Steffens um, in, oh, I'm sorry, that was in 1903. Uh, Gallatin sold the house in 1887 to Steffens. The state of California bought it from him in 1903 for a whopping $32,500. So what a deal, right? And they got this really impressive house. They added on a wing to have like the governor's office, I think, on it. And eventually, I think with the total cost for everything, it came out to be $56,000. So really uh, not, not too bad. Now it did house governors for a long time. I think the governors even today have an option of staying here. I swear one time I was driving on this street that we're on and I saw um, a, a little kid playing out front. And I, I, I swear it was our, our current governor with his child out front playing. I, I like would put money on that, but that was a few years ago now. Um, the first governor to live here was uh, George Party and his family. And we'll keep walking because we'll get to the other place, but it's like nice here in the shade. <laughs> they were the first residents who called this home of the new governor's mansion. Um, and like I said, a lot of people a lot of governors have been able to live there, but most governors today um, choose not to, or they find their own private home in Sacramento and choose not to call this one home. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I have another picture here. Um, I obviously have never been inside of it. I would love to though, oh my goodness. So um, 
if they ever open it up, and I think they used to, uh, not obviously during COVID times, uh, open it up just to the to visitors on like special days to go in and see, you would see um, something like this, which is their like really beautiful stairway inside. Oh my gosh. Someday I will see that in person. <laughs> We're gonna cross the street. Now, of the, uh, like I said, a lot of the governors who did live there at the beginning, most governors now do not live there, although I think Governor Brown did for at least a little while. But there has been quite a few um, famous, I guess, people who have come and visited, including Franklin Delano uh, Roosevelt and his wife Eleanor stayed overnight there. So that's pretty amazing, I think. Now, just literally a block away is this other Sacramento institution. And this, of course, is music theater. This is Sacram uh, Broadway Sacramento Musical Theater. Now, personally, I have never yet been here, but I, I can't wait to go. I've gone to quite a few theater productions, but at um, uh, a different auditorium that Sacramento has, because Sacramento has an amazing theater tradition. So let's talk a little bit about the music circus and why it's called that. This was started by Russell Lewis and Howard Young. These uh, people were already somewhat uh, in the, here, we'll pause here and kind of have this as the background. They were already, they had already produced like eight shows on Broadway, 27 for national tours. And uh, so they were already pretty, pretty uh, involved, I guess, in the, the theater business. Um, and they ended up heading west after World War II. I think they served in World War II and then headed west. And they really wanted to create a music circus on the west coast, but they hadn't decided where. Now, perhaps you're asking yourself, what is a music circus, <laughs> right? Well, that term and that tradition was started by John Terrell, who set up a circus tent uh, in the uh, uh, in a New Jersey field and he ended up producing like musical plays in this tent in this field and so it was a theater that was round and had just a very different feel to it you know much more accessible to some people and it became this really popular tradition in the United States but not so much on the west coast yet until of course Russell Lewis and Howard Young came out here now they were trying to decide where on the west coast they wanted to place this and they get a phone call from none other than Eleanor McClatchy. Ah, if you follow our museum, you know who Eleanor McClatchy is. We currently have the, uh, uh, an exhibit, the California in print, that is from Eleanor McClatchy's uh, collection. And uh, she was the editor of the Sacramento Bee. I mean, she's just an incredible lady and she was very much into theater and into uh, the, the arts and performing and making sure that Sacramento was a place that, that had these things. So she calls them up says come on to Sacramento and like meets with them they become like really good friends <laughs> and they decide that this in fact is where they're going to set up their music circus which they do in 1951 so let me make sure I get all that correct Yep. So in 1951, they launched Broadway at Music Circus, which is what this is. It's the first professional uh, musical theater in the round. That's important. And it was the first one of its kind west of the Mississippi. So that's pretty amazing. You can still see the architecture here is, is round. It's still a round theater. And it was only uh, at that time the fourth in the entire country. Now, it instantly became this big hit in Sacramento. People love to come and do these on their summer, summer nights. If you ask some people uh, who, uh, who've done this, it's always like this really special thing that they got to do. And I, I don't know, I just love that, like who, who live in Sacramento. Um, so it was in a canvas tent until 2002 and it presented a lot of problems, right? A canvas tent is bound to do that and they needed to just update it in general. So in 2003 on the same site, the original site of the canvas tent, they opened this, the Wells Fargo Pavilion. And so it still has the, the round theater, but it has a lot more uh, amenities, let's just say, for the audience and probably for the actors and the theater company as well. So I guess uh, it is the largest continually operating musical theater in the round in the country. So people who love theater come here to do this because it's the only one that's, uh, or it's the largest one, excuse me, that is left. And uh, that's just really special. So if you haven't had a chance to come and visit this, um, definitely do so. 
So over here, uh, definitely check out some of these really beautiful homes to our right because we're really starting to enter into more of, um, of the neighborhood part of Mansion Flats. Now, if you joined us for our Alkali Flat neighborhood um, walk, you know that this area has gone through so much change. It was a neighborhood, it was one of the wealthiest neighborhoods, until it had a streetcar that ran through it, until um, some of the more uh, larger businesses started to move into this area, and the houses became more like the homes for the people that were working at like these factories and these just like much larger kind of businesses. And so the, the wealthy uh, population, I guess, moved on to whatever neighborhood, and uh, this stayed as sort of this um, beautiful mix of working class, but also businesses. So, and that has continued, I think, until today. A lot of the homes that are original to this area have been converted into businesses. The one that was on the corner that we just walked by, that one was uh, a coffee shop. And so these homes get repurposed and they become new things. And I, I think that's really special. So. It's, a, it's kind of a, a cool neighborhood to take a walk around and just like, you can see the history here. You can see how much things have changed. So we're gonna turn the corner here, don't lose me. <laughs> and we are going to end at one of the more infamous houses in Sacramento. I'm gonna stand there. So this house was built in 1890 or in the 1890s, um, but it's more infamous for what was discovered in November 1988. Um, I am, of course, talking about uh, the serial killer Dorothea Puente, who lived here at that time and who uh, was running a boarding house. And she ran a boarding house for uh, people who were kind of in this transitional part of their lives. Um, they were very vulnerable and she took advantage of that. Um, I think that we can get lost in some of the more spectacular parts of this story and we forget that these people were very real and they lived very real lives and I'd like to actually say their names here uh, and in kind of a memory of them. Um, so their names are Ruth Monroe, Everson Gilmuth, Dorothy Miller, Benjamin Fink, Leona Car Carpenter, Alvaro Burt Montoya, Betty Palmer, James Gallup, and Vera Faye Martin. So uh, she was brought up on charges of uh, the murders of nine people. She was only convicted of three. And these are only the people that we, we know of too. So I think to keep that in mind, she of course was found guilty and she died in prison in 2011. Um, now the people who call this their house now, they, they call it their home. And I think that it's really important too to know that um, homes and houses, they have a history, but you know, it's the people in them that, that make it. And, and by all means, the people who live there now have, have made it their home and have found their, their joy and, and their happiness in everyday life here. Um, and I think that's important to know too on all the houses around here. This house has stood here for almost a hundred years before Dorothea Puente ever was around and it'll stand for a long time afterwards too. So a house, it just um, has a story and history, you know, of these homes and these houses, they, it doesn't stop. And so I encourage you when you are looking around, look at all the homes and think about their stories and what kind of stories that they can tell. Thank you everybody for joining me for this week's uh, Find Out More Friday Neighborly Walks in Mansion Flats. We've really enjoyed putting this together and we'll be back in, I think two more weeks and we'll be going through the Elmhurst neighborhood. Thank you.